I'm Tracy Metz. I'm the host of the live talk show and digital magazine Stadsleven, City Life. I'm here today interviewing Evgeny Morozov, internet critic, about his book, To Save Everything, Click Here. Evgeny, thank you for joining us. So I wanted to begin by talking about an article that you wrote for The New Yorker mm -hmm. with a wonderful title, Two Cheers for Boredom. Mm -hmm. Is it still possible for us to be bored now that technology is exerting this continual pull on our attention? Well, I think it's certainly possible. It's possible to get bored by technology. I mean, I know a lot of people who get bored by Facebook and Twitter and they crave them more and more. Right? It's a very different kind of boredom. It's mediated boredom. It's boredom where information uh, is everywhere and that in itself some of us find extremely overwhelming. Uh, the argument I made in the essay was that it's a very different type of boredom from the unmediated boredom that we had before, where you were on your own, where you had all sorts of thoughts uh, creeping into your head, uh, where you were forced to maybe think about things uh, that you wouldn't think otherwise, just because you saw that your mind was on some kind of autopilot and that never actually happens, right? All sorts of things and remedies and dreams uh, pop up. And uh, my uh, purpose in the article was to try to rediscover uh, some of the virtues of board, life, board living, right? And uh, to question how some of our decisions with regards to information architecture, how we build connectivity into our cities, how we build sensors into everything, how we expect to be always on thanks to mobile phones, how some of that might make boredom uh, structurally impossible, if you will, right? And how we can uh, reverse that process. You also have to defend yourself from an uh, overflow of information and the mm. demand on your time and attention. You've exactly. written that you have a safe yes. that where you can lock away your yes. uh, router cable yes. and your phone yes. and you even lock away the screwdrivers that you need to get into that yes. safe. Well, technological progress has helped me in that now I move to a different type of safe which doesn't have any screwdrivers in it. It's a very kind of Apple-ish model with a fully transparent uh, actually you know it has a electronic uh, kind of touch uh, button one button that operates the entire safe but the, the, my reasoning there was that as a writer I actually need downtime I need time where nothing will uh, bother me and you know and, and when I say bother it's not just tweets and messages it's also thoughts about tweets and messages right it's the temptation that is always there to go online so Thank what I do uh, in some sense, yes. Yeah. So w what I do is that I, like Ulysses, I tie myself to the mast. Uh, I want to, uh, I want to make it structurally impossible for me to get online. So instead of exercising self-control, actually hide the devices for connectivity away into the safe, and then I can have 10, 12 hours or days of unmediated uh, bliss of writing, reading, doing all the things I like. Being bored. Being bored, exactly. It's a wonderful uh, tool for, for boredom, right? And for me, it's actually, it's extremely helpful because it also allows me to understand how, when I do get online, how the experience is different, right? You can actually start seeing the difference once you have this forced exposure to the unmediated bored existence. Mm -hmm. You say that, uh, I read that your next book will be on urban space mm -hmm. and on how technology is changing the public realm and our experience of what is public. Yes. Can you tell me more about the coming book? Yeah, so I, I decided that, you know, it's very important to start understanding what makes cities tick and what makes cities important vehicles for social and political change. And it's clearly a city is much more than just a vehicle for delivering services to citizens. Right? And this is why, uh, which is why uh, Silicon Valley firms that are now providing all these uh, tools and platforms for making our cities smart don't want to talk about the more political, social uses of the city because they don't actually have tools uh, for that. They only have tools for making buses run on time, for making um, you know, weather forecast displayable everywhere. It's all about efficiency and making our lives easier. And my fear is that in technologizing many of these processes, we will also make it harder to engage in other uses of the city, if you will, right? And that might social mean uses. that, well, social uses, but also political uses. Cities are also places where protests happen. We've seen in a few years ago that the cities were key to the Occupy Wall Street movement. We have seen recently 
the events in Turkey, early in Brazil, where big public squares still operate as places where the sand uh, brews and where the sand actually happens. And in a world where every corner has a CCTV camera, where there are drones policing the space, where your identity can be spotted uh, through facial recognition software, where it becomes possible to prevent certain people from entering based on real-time analysis and data mining, uh, much of this um, uh, renegade maverick uses of space uh, will become harder. Right? So what I want to do in the book is to explore some of the most adversive uses of the city and to show how some of this commercial services driven agenda of turning out uh, our cities into smart cities might make it harder to, to, to actually get some of those more social uses. But is there of necessity a contradiction between making the city more efficient and making the city at the same time a politically, a politically free and open zone? Uh, well, again, depending on how you want to define efficiency. If you define efficiency as just the uh, uh, best use of scarce resources, uh, then you end up delegating a lot of law enforcement to technologies, for example, right? So you end up with the, this logic of the sleeping policeman or the speed bump, you know, which uh, makes cars slow down, right? Uh, kind of paramount. It, it now everything in the city can be governed through that logic where technology takes on the function of the law, yeah. right? And you can, might actually make it structurally impossible to break certain laws as you delegate uh, the enforcement of those laws to technologists. The question is, what happens once we change our norms? What happens once we decide that perhaps a certain law that we used to cherish in the past no longer corresponds to the demands and needs of societies? With laws, it was very easy. You just overthrow them, you pass another law, and people behave in differently. With technologists that take on the function of enforcing some of those laws is much harder. You need to go and rebuild the technologies. And my, my, my fear is that we might not even have the opportunity to rethink some of the norms behind those laws because law breaking itself becomes harder and almost impossible. Right? How do you engage in civil disobedience if you can't break the law? Because technology doesn't allow you to break the law. You know, you can't, it, it, it's like the hotel windows that we see in some modern hotels, which wouldn't allow you to open them because the fear is that you might fall down or whatever. Right? You can't, so that's the kind of paradigm that I fear, that everything in our cities will work that way. And as, as civil disobedience becomes impossible, it becomes much harder to actually question some of the social and political norms that some of these technologies promote. Mm -hmm. Have we outsourced our um, sense of morality to technology? Well, I mean, technology clearly plays on a moral function that we have not theorized as much as we should have. With, again, everything, even the design of our tables, you know, often make certain assumptions about what drawers ought to be remain closed and open. And, you know, the designers try to nudge you to do certain things with furniture. They try to nudge you now more and more in the kitchen to be more energy efficient. I mean, that's clearly happening. The way in which traditional theories of democracy have failed to theorize the role that technology plays in forcing morality, I think, is, is clearly, to me, it's evident that we haven't done a very good job. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Right? The question then is, how do we arrive at this moment of delegation. Who delegates and what, on what conditions? How do we redelegate? How do you then you know, break some of those technologies and impose newer ones? I mean, clearly it's not just technologies, it's also big companies that build them, whose interests are at stake, and very often they'll build their technologies in a way that will make it impossible to build another technology to replace it. It has to do with standards. I mean, those are very hard, very hard technical, but often political and economic questions. And I think that the only way in which we can answer it is to have a much better account of power, how power operates, how it connects to companies, how it connects to standards. And uh, we haven't done so. Instead, we have framed this debate as a debate between hum humanists and technologists, so you know, humanists and engineers, and the assumption that technology is either good or bad. And that's not the debate I want to have. I actually think we need to theorize technology not just as something that's material and anti-human, but something that also has a certain political and economic agenda behind it. And to understand it, you need to also map many other actors, not just the technology itself. You write that in our continually stimulated craving for the, the new and the now, that we don't give ourselves time to think. And this is something that we also solve with an app. 
On the blog for my talk show, we have a, a, a piece this week about a very funny new app called Google Maps. And it's a Google map mm -hmm. that gives you coordinates for places in the city where you can take a nap. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I love the idea of solving this problem of uh, uh, this continually simulated craving for the new yeah. to offset that with another technological solution. Yeah. Well, an even better technological solution would be to actually stay in your bed and sleep for 10 hours, which of course you cannot do because the demands of modern workplace require you to sleep for five hours and then get as much nap as you can sleeping on benches, which the app allows you to find. Right? And that's precisely my critique of technology. It yeah. shows it actually very nicely how technology and, and information technology specifically allows you to become much more resourceful as a citizen without actually doing anything about the structural causes of the problem in the first place. Mm. So this yes, is, we can now... This is what you call uh, solutionism. Yes. So yes, we can now discover many more places where you can get a quick nap, right? But it's, it's also clearly happening partly because we are not spending enough time sleeping, mm -hmm. right? And, and that also relates to my broader critique of many movements now known, for example, as life hacking. Right, which is one of them, which tries to uh, provide users with tools to hack their life. Right? And so what they do with sleep, for example, which is another kind of related discipline there called sleep hacking, they are trying to it put sensors they're trying to put sensors on their head and they're having sensors in their beds and they're recording their sleep patterns and they're trying to move into this phase of good sleep. You know, there are many phases of sleep and they're trying to move into the phase of the good sleep as fast as possible. And they can do it by practicing and analyzing data on the idea that even if you sleep for five hours a day, if you fall into the good sleep phase immediately, uh, you can actually get sleep that is as good as sleeping for 10 hours, right? Where again, you can see how the increased quantification and technologization, if you will, of a behavior that is as uh, analog as sleep uh, allows you to optimize it in a way that will not question the basic political and social uh, environment you are in and I think the right way forward is to actually do something about how much time we spend working mm -hmm. and not just try to be as resourceful as we can be about the use of the resources mm -hmm. that, that we have. Mm -hmm. Is this, um, being American myself, I might be inclined to say that this is a typical American approach to time to, to squeeze as much in as we possibly can and to optimize it in every possible way, which turns out, as you say, to be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the whole world has embraced this yeah. uh, go, go, go mentality. Why are we so susceptible to this? Why have we outsourced our responsibility, maybe even our morals, to the private sector in Silicon Valley? Well, because we live under a capitalist regime. I can give you a sort of a, a much more prosaic answer, but I think that's the, I mean, that, 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 that then explains all the other uh, consequences. The privatization of problem solving, the increased marketization of everyday life, the fact that now your personal data is becoming an asset, the commodification of social relationships under, you know, social networking. I mean, they can have a very nice explanation that follows from one basic premise and it has to do with the, the kind of basic economic and political conditions through which we live. It has nothing but, to do but with But this must appeal to some deep need inside of us to be connected, to be in the know. There, I mean, the, this private sector uh, yeah. approach of Silicon Valley wouldn't have gotten such a hook into us if we hadn't been susceptible to this. But why are we so susceptible? No, I mean, what is susceptible? I mean, like you can try to be offline and get a safe, but I can assure you that if you have a job, where the expectation is that you have to check your email in the evening, you wouldn't be able to take the approach that I have, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm an exception. I would never go and advocate for people not to have a you know, cell phone or to get themselves a safe, as a lot of people would be advocating. A lot of privacy advocates would tell you, you should not be on Facebook, you should not be using a mobile phone. To be arguing that is to completely forget the fact that the expectations of most social institutions these days is that if you're not on Facebook and if you don't have a cell phone, you must be a terrorist hiding somewhere in the basement and above that. Or I mean, that's a, the expectation. At least some kind of weirdo. 
No, no, no. But 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 that also explains to you why you cannot have you know you cannot have boredom for reasons that have nothing to do with technology. They have everything to do with the way in which uh, modern social and economic institutions expect you to deliver. And unless you go and change something about that, you know you are not going to solve that problem. So you might say that that's a problem. It's the human need to always be on. I would say that that's partly a human need to always be on and probably for the most part is the expectation that unless you're on, you're not going to succeed in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say that we need a, a political movement akin to the environmental movement of the yeah. 60s and 70s. You call it the degrowth movement. Yeah. What would this look like? Would it be a political party? Would it be a grassroots movement? What would it look like? No, I mean, I think it has to start as a grassroots movement. It has to start by politicizing uh, and destabilizing uh, things and activities that Silicon Valley wants us to take for granted. They want to take us for granted that the only way to pay for our communication services and activities is by paying for them with our own data. Why is that the case? I mean, you can also pay for these things with investing public money into infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are all sorts of other alternative solutions which Silicon Valley would today reject by saying that that's not how the internet developed. Therefore, this is how not it should. This is therefore how it should not develop in the future. Right? And there is a certain explanatory role that the very idea of the internet plays in uh, the kind of arguments advanced by big technology companies and convincing us that what they do is perfectly natural and embodies and reflects the spirit of the internet. And what crazy people like me want to do sounds as if it's going to break the internet. That's exact rhetoric they would make. And you know, for me, breaking the internet, I don't see a big problem with it because I don't think that the goal of our public policy should be the preservation of some uh, metaphor that, uh, which is what the internet is at this point. It's but not just a protocol; it's also a set of various intellectual, you know, dispositions. Yeah. The goal of our public policy should be the emancipation of human beings. Yeah. But the internet has become, many would say, an indispensable tool for reaching citizens, for offering people a podium to, to get together, to unite, to uh, demonstrate. Yeah, but there is not, nothing inevitable about Facebook being the primary tool and platform in which we should base our com communal uh, communication activities. Mm -hmm. You can say that you know the roads are also have become essential to modern commerce and modernity. I mean, whether you have tolls on the road is not something that's inevitable and comes with the road. <laughs> it comes from a set of political and economic decisions that we make. And Facebook has convinced us, and Google and many other Silicon Valley companies have convinced us that their regulation and that the, the way in which they were allowed to do what they did was personal data. It's the only inevitable, natural way for the internet to develop in this clearly not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, you also talk about the roles of drones and smart cars and sensors. Sure. And it seems like we live now in an almost completely immaterial technological construct. Are these places, are these objects, drones, smart cars, sensors, are they really organizing our life for us? I mean, they are. I mean, they're making it easier. Again, in your question, there are a lot of things like I don't agree with. I mean, there is nothing immaterial about drones. I mean, try explaining that to Yemeni mm -hmm. kids whose parents were killed by a drone, that they were killed by immaterial technology. They'll probably disagree. Okay. But uh, the, 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 the broader... And, and again, we, we, I, I don't think that it's those technologies that are organizing our lives. It's the various approaches to political and economic and social governance that those technologies are just the, 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 the means to mm -hmm. that structure our lives. I mean, clearly drones don't develop and fly by themselves, even though they're presented as autonomous. I mean, there is a decision made in some police department to dispatch drones to uh, make sure that the protest doesn't uh, proceed, right? Uh, so the way in which they allow a high degree of control and exclusion and a high degree of analysis and real-time control, essentially, of social activities, for me, that's clearly a very disturbing uh, implication of the proliferation of such technologies mm -hmm. into our everyday environment. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think sensors for all the good that they can deliver can also be very powerful uh, tools that would assist those in power. So you, yes, you can, build, you can build a sensor into a trash can outside somewhere on the street that will inform the delivery truck uh, the tra trash can, whatever truck, when it needs to be filled 
and refilled and picked up and, and whatnot. But the same sensor can also gather information about what's being thrown into the cat trash can by whom. It can be used as a kind of, you know, as a, as, a, as a set of sensors that will detect how many people are gathering in a certain spot. I mean, there are all sorts of other types of data that such a trash can is capable of recording. And we don't actually have a good way to uh, prevent uh, such sensor-based technologies from being misused. No. I heard recently from IBM that they use, they've installed a system of sensors in uh, Rio de Janeiro mm -hmm. that uh, help warn for flooding. And they've discovered that these sensors are also excellent for traffic management. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if they're good for traffic management, they're probably good for other forms of surveillance mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the good and efficient intentions almost lead seamlessly into abuse of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, once uh, it's very hard to make sure the technologies that we build and use are one purpose only. Many of them, of course, can serve multiple purposes depending on the political agenda that uh, is behind the, the users of those tools, right? And very often we end up building technologies and networks that sound extremely emancipatory on paper, but then uh, actually lead to abuses like of a power. Social platform in the yeah, but you know, many other digital tools, as we have discovered in the wake of the Snowden revelations, mm -hmm. you know, they might seem like they even offer some privacy and protection, but in reality, when they are being tapped and abused by those in power, they actually make the situation much worse. Okay, so let me ask the ultimate, basic question behind all of this: What is the alternative? Well, what's the alternative is to actually bring back some of the politics which Silicon Valley and technologists are deliberately trying to suppress and present those developments as either inevitable or as just a consequence of our consumeristic lifestyle mm -hmm. and to uh, actually rediscover a language that does not operate in the terms imposed by Silicon Valley it could be a good first step when we are buying into their language all the time, whether it's the, the concepts like disruption, entrepreneurship, or innovation, uh, all of that comes, so even the idea of hacking, that we can now not just hack software, you also hack education, hack healthcare, have entire governments organizing hackathons. I mean, our entire discursive vocabulary has been corroded by uh, the language that favors a particular group of corporate actors. Mm -hmm. uh, if the bankers were doing something similar, we would all be up in arms. With Silicon Valley, we take it naturally because we think that it's just an extension of progress or science and, and so forth. And to start at least uh, pointing out that many of the things we take for granted because they help innovation are not actually all that good, that, that they, you know, innovation in itself cannot be the sole goal of public policy. And unfortunately, a lot of people who, even people, a lot of smart people on the left don't, don't see that. For them, innovation is the goal, just as it is for the left and the right now. And figuring out what those alternative conceptions of the common good might be that are not rooted in the language of innovation and economic growth might be a good first step. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, remembering the title of your story for The New Yorker, Two cheers for boredom, but I don't think you ever have a minute to get bored. Well, I'm doing my best, but it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Evgeny.